Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, 12th class for the University of Reddit Introduction to Japanese Language and Culture. Uh, this evening, we will be uh, listening to our guest speaker. And I'm sorry that I didn't post a homework from the last session. I have been extremely busy with work, which is a good thing, but bad for you guys. I'm sorry. But fortunately, we don't have a lot of actual language uh, content today, so I'll probably whip up the homework from last week after this session, so you guys can, uh, you know, have, have an assignment for the for the material we covered at the la in the last class. And there's going to be a little bit of language. Well, there's going to be a decent amount of language, you know, obviously uh, in this um, lecture today. So uh, there'll be some some new vocab words added that I'll probably just integrate with the grammatical structures that we introduced on Thursday. So. Um, that's pretty much all the administrative stuff, so um, go ahead and introduce my uh, long old friend, David. He uh, went to high school, studied Japanese with me in high school, and studied Japanese with me in college, and we've been to Japan together a couple times, what, once or twice, and, um, you know, he lived in Japan. His Japanese is, is much better than mine. He lived in Japan for... Um, I think, what was it, six years, David? Five. Five years, okay. Uh, David lived in Japan for five years in Shikoku, teaching English with the JET program, is that right? That's right. Okay. So uh, he has a lot more hands-on experience with Japanese than I do. I've never lived in Japan, if you recall. I've only been there for extended periods of time on vacation. So um, I wish he was teaching you language, but his other passion is art and Japanese art, and uh, he's an amazing artist, and... Uh, he's actually getting his master's right now in art history, David, or I'm sorry, what, what are you getting here? Uh, visual art. Visual art, okay, so he's like a really, really, really good artist. Um, so his Japanese is better than mine, his artistic abilities are better than mine, he's, he's prettier than me. Oh, stop <laughs> I mean, it. He's all around but better than me. Um, the only thing I really have on, him, I have on him is I have it, my kid is cuter than his because he doesn't have a kid, I'm sure if he had a kid, his is probably cuter than mine, but... Uh, he doesn't have one, so... <laughs> okay, so continuing on, as he asked of me, um, I will go ahead and... Oh, and also, I almost forgot. Whew, this presentation will have nudity in it. Uh, male and female full, full frontal nudity is uh, uh, a, a lecture on Japanese post-World War II art, so um, the content will have... Uh, naked bodies. So if you are under 18, you have been warned. Please, I think we have one 16 year old student that comes. I, I can't, I'm not sure who it is, but uh, if you are uh, under 18 and you aren't like sitting there with your parent next to you or something, then please close the window and don't watch or something. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying to give you a disclaimer. So you've officially been disclaimed. <laughs> We're safe. <laughs> We're safe. Okay. So um, there's naked people. So watch out. If you're offended by that, please leave now. Uh, that being said, I'll go ahead and give the floor to David, and I'll be in the chat room with you guys, uh, translating real-time any words that he may use that you may not understand. So, David, uh, if you don't mind, please go ahead. All right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, like Rob said, I uh, studied Japanese in high school and got my degree in East Asian Language and Culture. And then I lived and studied art in Japan for five years. Uh, so uh, I thought that I would go ahead and uh, talk with you all about contemporary Japanese art. Uh, but specifically the Japanese art that uh, to me is, uh, is uniquely Japanese. And it's also the Japanese uh, art that the Japanese people themselves are buying and loving. The five artists that I'm going to talk about tonight are dearly loved by the Japanese people. So... Hopefully uh, that will help us uh, understand uh, their message. So let me screen share. We'll start my PowerPoint presentation. All right. How's that? Looks good. All right. So I'm going to start my uh, post-war Japanese art uh, 
narrative with Butoh dance. Butoh is this dance form that arose out of uh, Hiroshima in the late 50s, uh, early 60s. And uh, as you can see, it is a weird, weird dance. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see some of this while living in Japan, and it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. Um, uh, it's typically done in the nude. Um, the bodies uh, are painted with white powder, and the faces are generally sort of um, mask-like, freakish, you know, faces. Uh, it's it's one of the scariest things I've ever seen, and uh, they call it the Dance of Darkness because it's supposed to evoke a kind of silent scream that the Japanese psyche uh, is experiencing after the war. Horrible tragedy. Uh, it's also very much um, into the transgression of uh, Japanese post-war society where... How should I put it? the all of their sort of cultural identities had been destroyed and now they had a chance to uh, rebuild uh, who they decided that they would become so uh, buto dance arose um, let's see the founder Kazuo Ono uh, the very first buto dance was of his son uh, having sex with a chicken <laughs> and that was, yeah, and that was, this was in uh, 1959, I believe, and that was, um, mm. uh, that was based off of the popular Japanese novel uh, Forbidding Colors by Yukio Mishima, who uh, some of you out there probably know, a uh, very famous Japanese gay author, maybe sort of like the Oscar Wilde of Japan. Anyway, uh, this dance, uh, as you can see, um, there's a lot of mouth opening, uh, there's the nudity, and uh, the icon in the bottom left is from the movie Baraka, uh, which has some great and terrifying Butoh dance in it. But uh, this kind of tragic psyche, this silent psyche, the Butoh dance is also performed extremely slow. So uh, all of these faces and bodies are not just standing there, they are uh, they're moving at an incredibly slow pace, a hauntingly slow pace, uh, which some critics say uh, brings attention to all the effort that it takes to dance, which is kind of the opposite of Western dance, which tries to mask the effort and appear effortless. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try to set up the narrative in a compare and contrast form uh, because... Uh, the Japanese identity, as well as the Western identity, is um, sort of re reciprocally uh, related to each other. You know, we're always comparing and contrasting East and West. All right, so there's the context: scary Japanese naked dance uh, arising out of uh, post, you know, war. The contemporary Japanese artists uh, that we're going to look at. Takashi Murakami, uh, he's probably the most famous. They call him the Andy Warhol of Japan, which is sort of an insult because Andy Warhol was doing this kind of stuff 50 years ago. Uh, he's probably more like the Jeff Koons of Japan, if that makes any sense. And uh, his big emphasis is on the Japanese super flat graphic sensibility, uh, cuteness, Japanese cuteness, kawaii culture, uh, mushrooms, and uh, sort of this signification of mushrooms in Japan, and also merchandise. Um, he produces what, uh, what Japan produces the best, tiny plastic figurines, you know, um, cute little collectibles. Uh, we're, then we're going to look at Tenmyoya Hisashi. Hisashi uh, is sort of the punk rock artist of Japan. He depicts the Japanese spirit and sort of Japanese archetypes um, gangsters and dragons and tattooed samurais. Uh, then we're going to look at Aida Makoto, uh, who explores Japanese, uniquely Japanese eroticism and uh, what's called Edo Gudo, uh, which is, you know, the combining of the words Edoi and Gudoi, or erotic and grotesque. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yayoi Kusama, 
she's sort of the queen bee of all these guys. She influenced Yoko Ono. Uh, we're going to talk about her. She's known as the polka dot princess, and she does work with uh, within the uh, concept of obliteration. And then we're going to finish with Kono Ike Tomoko, uh, who explores uh, the Japanese imaginary world of dreams, of uh, Japanese fairy tales, uh, six-legged wolves, flying daggers, and these really strange disembodied legs, which, like I said, uh, are a hot item in Japan. Uh, all of these artists, they're doing something right because uh, they're, they're extremely successful, and the Japanese people love them, so they must be expressing something genuinely uh, Japanese and uh, something that is in the mysterious Japanese psyche. Uh, but first, let's just do a quick review of uh, Japanese art from the Edo period, because uh, most of the artists, the contemporary artists we're going to review uh, are, you know responding to this kind of Japanese uh, sensibility. Here we have a uh, typical uh, ukiyo-e uh, print from Hiroshige. Ukiyo-e, ukiyo you know, means floating world, and it refers to sort of um, this dreamy, transient uh, world, sort of a Buddhistic uh, world that the Japanese people live in. The prints always uh, emphasize you know, the fleetingness of life, you're going to see some birds flying, you're going to see uh, people going about their everyday lives, but also formally uh, we get the feeling of emptiness because uh, we get the feeling of flatness. Uh, the mountain, it, it, there's no substance to it. Uh, we can tell that the background sky and the middle ground mountains and the foreground figures and then the paper that everything is on uh, all contains the same substance. So uh, these kinds of prints uh, were kind of um, mystical in that they, they would reveal uh, the integrating, you know, emptiness of uh, reality. <clears throat> uh, also, we can notice the, uh, the lines in the figures' faces or the lines around the figures' hats are of the same thickness as the lines... Uh, outlining Mount Fuji. So there's nothing really realistic about this space. Uh, it's very flat, it's very graphic, um, it's clearly drawn. Uh, not to mention the calligraphy in the sky and the calligraphy uh, in the, on the uh, right side sort of re-emphasizes that a flat picture plane. Uh, here's another one by Hir Hiroshige. And uh, Hiroshige Ando is one of the most influential and famous of the um, ukiyo-e artists. Of course, Hokusai is up there too. But I wanted to show you this print because it's not that we don't get a sense uh, of three-dimensionality with, with these works. We definitely feel the space. Uh, the Japanese artists were using size, contrast, diminution. They were using uh, overlapping uh, details of the waves sort of... Uh, become erased as you go farther back into the distance. Uh, but that's all sort of done with, uh, with the design and with the line work. Uh, these are very well drawn. Uh, also, during the Edo period were these Nanga or Bujinga, Bujinga paintings, intellectual paintings. And uh, like I said, you know, they were very Buddhist in that uh, the movement of the brush strokes and the calligraphy, I mean, monks were making these too as part of their religious practice. Um, the fleetingness of the, and the fluidity of the line brings attention to uh, the movements of the mind. And uh, we have to sort of read the scene like we're reading a book. And since the forms are all abstract, you know, trees don't look like that, mountains don't look like that, we actually have to construct the space uh, conceptually or intellectually, which is uh, why these were so satisfying to the, um, to the smart people of Japan that were consuming them. All right, so let's do a little compare and contrast just so we can get a feel for uh, the difference and what uh, later Japanese artists are going to be uh, calling flatness, which is typically Japanese. Uh, here we have a Nanga painting of some mountains, beautiful Nanga painting. 
And then we have uh, a painting by Frederick Church of the Hudson River Valley School, an American painter. And you can see uh, in the Western landscape painting, the realist painting, there's, there are no lines. Uh, there is no abstraction uh, in the same way that there's an abstraction in patterning uh, in the Nanga painting. No, instead it's meant to be a, an illusion. It's meant to look like a window into another world. The picture plane completely vanishes. Whereas in the Nanga painting, the picture plane is continually uh, reinforced every moment. All right, just to drive uh, this idea home, here's another comparison. And these paintings were going on at the exact same time. Perhaps the content of the uh, Nanga paintings were the, the actual, you know, action and the brush and the ink and the paper, all of that, the materials were part of the content. Uh, but the, con the materials are not part of the content at all in the Western painting. Uh, it's, the, it's that mysterious light and the space and the illusion and the kind of feeling of the sublime. All of that is the content. So while Hiroshige was doing these, uh, these badass, you know, uh, flat, geometric uh, paintings of waterfalls, Church was doing uh, this kind of painting of waterfalls. I'm not saying uh, that one is better than the other, but uh, just that they're completely different. Now, which one of these do you think influenced the Impressionists? Because this is all pre-Impressionism. Uh, the Impressionists in Europe were actually most impressed with um, Hiroshige. And uh, Hiroshige Prince moved over and influenced Vincent van Gogh, uh, where before he was sort of going after dark, gloomy, realist paintings, after he encountered Hiroshige Prince, he started copying them. And all of his paintings uh, from that point on sort of resembled Japanese ukiyo-e prints. Hmm. And uh, this is also a good example of how the Japanese organize their space, because um, you get a, you definitely get a feeling of depth and space, even though uh, everything is completely flat. See all those tiny figures along the uh, horizon line? Those are tiny, uh, and there's and there's sort of um, each window in between the branches of the tree act as a kind of um, compressed space. That's how they did it. And uh, this really excited uh, the Impressionists in Europe. Here's another uh, copy of um, a Hiroshige print by Vincent van Gogh. But, so uh, these this are actually paintings by van Gogh copying the original? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're paintings by van Gogh. And uh, Bonnard, uh, Lautrec, Monet, uh, Cezanne, they were all influenced by Japanese art and uh, Impressionism would have been impossible without Japanese art and then we have the post-impressionists, then we have the cubists, then we have the abstract expressionists and then we have Andy Warhol, Jackson Pollock and contemporary Western art today. The sort of untold narrative is that uh, all of that depends on Hiroshige. Hmm. Hiroshige is sort of the father of um, all of our contemporary art in that sense. Here is a picture of Monet uh, in his living room and all those pictures behind him are uh, Japanese prints. Mm. They loved them, they ate them up. Mm. Alright, so we're going to go into our first artist now with um, an understand a little bit better understanding of flatness. Takashi Murakami. Uh, he, like any good Japanese artist, um, conflates high and low so that, uh, you know, a million dollar painting uh, will have the same subject matter as the five dollar doll. And he's not afraid to just, what we would say, sell out. And um, he's a businessman, uh, artist. He came to America and he had his first uh, exhibition in 2001 called Super Flat, uh, where he showed us the development of this character, Mr. Dobb. Now, Mr. Dobb is a really interesting character. It's, it's his alter ego, is what he says. And, um, what should I say? Well, first I'll just start with the name Dobb. Dobb is a contraction of um, the Dada-like phrase, 
dobojite, dobojite, which means um, why, why. I think it comes from doshte, doshte. And uh, he kind of, through dob, uh, can you see the D is in the ear, and then the O is the face, and then the B? So cute. Um, but he wanted to create an icon which was um, authentically Japanese, but also had a universal appeal. Uh, it's not modeled after, after Mickey Mouse, but, you know, it, we could see that. He actually modeled it after, after a Doraemon, which is a popular Japanese uh, character, this robot-cat-wizard hybrid. Um, does Murakami, being an artist, feel like he's some sort of robot, uh, techno technological, you know, a human hybrid wizard? Maybe. Um, but it's also Sonic the Hedgehog. He talks about Sonic the Hedgehog being an influence in uh, video games. So, uh, what, year, what year did this come? This character. That, uh, he came out in the '90s and uh, then was introduced to America in 2001 with Super Flat. Hmm. Uh, you can see the Super Flat mentality with um, again. See these paintings are flat. They have a flat silver background, flat patches of color. Uh, some of it looks sort of three dimensional, but that's just the the drawing. And he did use a lot of technology to make these. First, he um, sketches uh, the idea, but then he scans it into the computer and uses Photoshop to sort of clean up all the lines and to create a sort of three-dimensionality. And then um, he will print it and enlarge it on the canvases and then have his factory do the painting. So he actually doesn't paint any of these. Uh, like Warhol or like a lot of other artists, he, has a, um, he hires, hires people to do it. And this allows him to make a lot of work, a lot of big work, and uh, yeah. Also, I want you to notice uh, all these eyes and how Daub, Mr. Daub, kind of turns freaky in this painting. Uh, also, we can see Sonic the Hedgehog, we can see Pikachu, we can see some other sort of references that he's trying to make with this character, and we can see this um, stamp like um, icon um, like uh, flower, happy flower. Uh, you know, and in a way, Japan sort of invented uh, the crest or the the stamp or the um, the icon. Uh, he did work with Louis Vuitton appropriately, uh, developing this sort of icon, this Japanese icon. Hmm. And uh, I have to wonder is his emphasis on the eyes might be related to uh, this Bodhidharma Daruma doll. Um, see the red, how. Uh, the daub's eye, just one eye is colored in. Yeah. Eyes, too, uh, I wonder if they have anything to do with um, psychedelics and uh, awareness in psychedelics, the way that Alex Gray, uh, the American painter, uses eyeballs all over his stuff. Uh, he says that uh, these paintings depict the tragic apocalyptic paradise that is Japan today. And uh, if you wiki this artist, um, you'll find out that he's pretty damn critical of consumer culture and the way that Japan has just sort of um, become as shallow as it can possibly be. Mm. Where here now, uh, super flat also refers to hyper capitalism and um, shallow spirituality. Although he's also using it to make bank. <laughs> so. Here's a Daub mouse pad. All right, then we get a little bit more interesting uh, when we find Supernova from 1999. The uh, mushrooms are, um, well, it's interesting that uh, he, he's starting to pick mushrooms now because this is also about the time when uh, Paul Statnitz uh, came out with his Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World. Have you seen that TED Talk? Uh -huh. Mushrooms might be the way of the future. Uh, they can, you know, clean polluted soil, make insecticides, uh, treat smallpox, you know. Mm. Uh, you should check out the TED Talk. But also uh, the mushroom, oh, and Japanese people love to eat mushrooms too, so mm. there's, there's that element. 
But also, can you see the Mount Fuji uh, icon through the top of the mountain? Yeah. Of Fuji, and uh, we also have to admit, and and he's the first to admit that the mushroom uh, in the Japanese psyche also immediately uh, signifies the mushroom cloud of uh, mm -hmm. the atom bomb. So this is a good example of how uh, culturally relative uh, sign can be, because we might see the mushroom and think psychedelic mushrooms, whereas uh, the first thing a Japanese person might think is that horrific uh, atom bomb of Hiroshima. Yeah. Uh, then I wonder what the eyes mean and if he's trying to bring attention to um, awareness of that. Look at all those eyeballs. Here's uh, another scene of that painting. You can see how big the painting is. And uh, these mushrooms have also been likened to Andy Warhol's uh, flat paintings of Elvis because they're both um, you know, popular Japanese icons and uh, they're on silver backgrounds. So then we have Time Bokan. He did this one in pink, but he, uh, like I said, these are paintings that his factory makes, and he does he does them in every color. But the image is lifted from the children's show uh, Time Bokan, and which ends in um, every episode ends in a kind of apocalyptic explosion, and there's the skull image. Time Bokan. The profound tragedy is combined with the reference to a cartoon so that uh, the cultural ramifications of the bomb on Japanese culture are laid flat. So now we get um, a Mr. Dob mushroom hybrid. And uh, I think this is the highlight of Murakami's work because, um, as I wrote, it's a kind of multi-dimensional graphic for the current human, robot, wizard, mushroom, cloud, Japanese hybrid identity. Also, uh, with regards to the painting on the right, uh, everyone is both the same and a little bit different, which uh, is typically Japanese, the uniformity. So, Lonesome Cowboy, 1998. Uh, these are enlarged, uh, exaggerated otaku figurines. Otaku, you know, uh, is sort of the uh, nerd culture of Japan, the comic book gaming culture, uh, the anime culture. And um, these were, of course, anime otaku-inspired, uh, factory-produced, um, naked, blatantly sexual um, imagery, self-aware, too. Uh, you know, it's hard to say when uh, the artists are sort of exaggerating these things and enlarging them, it's hard to say that um, the Japanese culture isn't fully conscious of what it's doing. Um, it's almost like the, the art has found the secret fantasy lands of uh, Japan and, you know, says, ah, you're not getting away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shine a light on you, I'm going to enlarge you and uh, show you off uh, for posterity and for catharsis. Um, everything is uh, sort of magnified versions of mass consumable items. And uh, there's, there's tons of theory about why the Japanese um, view breasts in that way or view breast milk in that way or uh, view semen in this way. Here's another uh, version of the same uh, theme. Uh, you can see the simulated uh, brush uh, work painting on the uh, behind this this figurine uh, which kind of gives us a new meaning of um, what a brush stroke can be um, is this also the artist sort of uh, critiquing the masturbatory nature of making art with this you know expressionistic brush stroke which is the semen coming out of you know this twinks naked body. I don't know. Uh, he was also doing this series of uh, flat Bodhidharma paintings. Um, and I just love the title of this uh, series. I open wide my eyes but see no scenery. I fix my gaze upon my heart and that I may tra time transcend. That a universe in my heart may unfold. And it's from this show, Tranquility of the Heart, Torment of the Flesh, 
open wide the eye of the heart, and nothing is invisible. All right, and then I'm going to end with this um, show that actually he curated uh, called Little Boy, um, which you know is uh, one of the code words for the Hiroshima bomb. And uh, this was also, a lot of you probably know him because of his work with uh, Kanye and Louis Vuitton. And uh, now we're going to move into Temyoya Hisashi. Hisashi, I got to see a number of his exhibits in Japan, and he is by far one of my favorites uh, because he is self-consciously trying to depict the Japanese spirit, uh, Japanese archetypes, Japanese stereotypes, Japanese prototypes, uh, Japanese ghost stories. He's retelling Japanese ghost stories. He's, uh, he's depicting deities, but sort of in you know, contemporary ways. He's really great. Here's a close-up of uh, those two paintings which, you know, is depicting some sort of uh, epic battle of naked samurai. Uh, all on this traditional gold leaf background. Here are um, two examples of uh, typical gold leaf uh, screens. And, uh, yeah, here's, here's another one. Bunshin. Uh, Bunshin uh, is the word for um, other person or um, other body. Yeah, alter ego, and uh, Tenmyoya often talks about alter egos in Japan as uh, represented by tattoos, and how um, they inscribe their alter egos onto their skin. So in this case, the alter ego is a dragon, um, but often uh, deities um, of any gender get tattooed onto the uh, Japanese body, male body, um, as a kind of alter ego. Uh, we can also see the flatness, but he is he's unique in that he's also using some uh, shading that is so common in Western art. He synthesizes them both brilliantly. We get that deep space and the uh, flat picture plane. So here we go, painting of Gundam. Sold for approximately six hundred thousand at a Christie's auction in uh, Hong Kong, and we can see that alter ego tattoo again. Uh, he's actually tattooing the um, the armor of this Gundam figure, uh, which also kind of brings attention to the idea that our bodies, our skin, is kind of like our armor, and. Uh, I've recently been studying all this uh, stuff about bacteria and biofilm, and I guess there's, uh, there's bacteria that actually do protect us on our skin like armor, but uh, I think he's also referring to the um, tattoos role in inscribing cultural texts onto the body, which then are read by viewers as protective armor. Also, I love it that he says he wants to emphasize Gundam's samurai origins. All right, here's another image. In my mind, the distinctions between combat video games, manga, ukiyo-e have become blurred. This is a painting that combines on a single screen the features of moving images, manga frames, and single prints. Okay, and then um, from 1997 to 2004, he did this series of 10 paintings called Japanese Spirit, uh, which were intended to be viewed by foreigners uh, but they were also for uh, Japanese uh, people, and it's, they're just, it's just filled with stereotypes and Japanese archetypes. Uh, he says, um, where's that? I can't find my quote. Gangsta. <laughs> and then this one's probably his most famous, Kamikaze from a Kabuku series. Kabuku uh, is a Japanese word which means, um, and it's related to Kabuki and Kabuki theater, but it signifies this tendency to sort of wear elaborate costumes and to go out and be crazy bohemian, uh, which is part of the Japanese spirit. Uh, he says that uh, the trucker culture in Japan or the motorcycle gangs in Japan 
are the true successors of this kind of Japanese spirit. Um, and in this painting, he's kind of mixing that outlaw, anti-establishment biker culture uh, with uh, the infamous kamikaze plane, which can kind of suggest a critique, I think, that maybe he's saying over time uh, those once marginal and um, anti-establishment, uh, it can become um, orthodox tradition and, you know, scary The um, the Japanese culture, you know, sort of invented suicide bombers, and we've got to imagine that the kamikaze uh, tradition sort of um, looms in the back of uh, the Japanese psyche. Here's another great painting. Gold leaf background, intertwining thought, uh, where he's um, sort of integrating tattoo, naked men, samurai swords, bats, um, tentacles all intertwined together to give us, um, you know, a narrative of a figure fighting himself. All right, moving on. Mm -hmm. Aida Makoto. Uh, hey, David, Aida just, just, to yeah. let you, just to let you know, um, we got 20 minutes left. So great. I just okay, great. Aida Makoto um, Erogudo. Eroi uh, means erotic or perverted, but uh, it's used so often that we might, the English term might be dirty. Like, ooh, that's dirty. They'll say, eroi ne. Um, and then gudoi means grotesque or um, what we might say disturbing. Like, isn't that scene disturbing? And uh, this painting, Blender 2001, sort of shook everybody and um, everyone mm -hmm. in Japan loved it. It's um, thousands of cute, young, Japanese girls uh, happy as can be as they're blended up. <laughs> I made a, a Makoto, awesome. uh, he makes, uh, he turns women into food, uh, which is a critique on the way that women are viewed in Japanese culture and uh, objectified. Uh, but he's also very interested in uh, this Japanese eroticism, Erogudo, and tentacle uh, eroticism. Um, yeah, the young female body, um, and this is, this is kind of basic, but the, the female body represents Japan. Uh, Japan had, you know, a female sun deity, and uh, women are the ones who uh, created Japanese script and literature, and uh, kabuki, and sort of high, all high art uh, was sort of spearheaded by women. Uh, this is one of the reasons I love studying Japanese culture. Uh, it's so different from our own. Uh, they, I don't know of any other culture that really has a sun, a female sun deity. Uh, but anyway, um, even though... Oh, well, actually, first I also want to say, um, and Ida says this a lot, that uh, even though manga and anime are sort of pushed aside and not considered high art, um, uh, they are the most honest and original forms of visual expressions for the Japanese people and what the Japanese people actually want, what they're actually thinking about, um, their, their desires and their fears. So uh, that's why he uses this sort of anime style, this sort of manga style. And uh, we've seen this before in Hokusai's The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. Um, and this is actually... Um, the source material for um, the painting, uh, The Giant Member Fuji versus King Ghidorah of 1993. Um, so yeah, it's an homage to Hokusai, uh, but it's, like I said, set in the context of otaku culture. Uh, Fuji is the female character um, from the 1960s anime Ultraman, and um, yeah, critics argue that she represents Japan, and uh, she is sort of this coveted body of, a, of this healthful yet now defenseless young girl, um, maybe a kind of defeated embodiment of, of, once a, of a once proud and powerful Japan um, now laid, laid to rest. Uh, also, look at how he wipes away the register of fear or pain 
and humiliation. Um, he does this with all of uh, the young girls. They're sort of, uh, they're all in a kind of serene paralysis um, as they're being devoured or penetrated uh, by, in this case, the three-headed dragon monster Ghidorah, um, who symbolizes America. Um, God, I love this painting. It foregrounds, uh, yeah, the prominence of the monster in Japanese, in popular uh, Japanese post-war imagination. Um, Ida is inspired by uh, Godzilla movies. Uh, specifically, in this case, uh, the film, um, what is it, 1991 film, uh, Gojira vs. King Ghidorah. And um, as many of you know, the first kaiju uh, eiga, uh, the monster movies, uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, 1954, is a reenactment of the Second World War, uh, where Gojida is the U.S., or more specifically, um, the A-bomb made flesh. And the monster, this monster, awoken uh, and mutilated by radiation, destroys, you know, Tokyo. Uh, here's another series he did, um, the dog series, of these, you know, healthy girls and unseen, unknown master. Um, they're mutilated, um, and yet they, they look oblivious to their condition. And, uh, yeah, Aida is very critical of contemporary, Jan uh, contemporary Japan's um, obliviousness. His most recent work uh, is this one called Ash Color Mountains, which depicts, God, thousands of uh, salarymen, being churned up in these in these mountains of ashes. All right, next, Yayoi Kusama, the polka dot princess. Pulled out this quote: "A polka dot has the form of the sun, which is a symbol of the energy of the whole world and our living life, and also the form of the moon, which is calm, round, soft, colorful, senseless, and unknowing. Polka dots become movement. Polka dots." are a way to infinity. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah, she became famous in the 60s when she came over to America and started making these penis chairs. <laughs> and um, the, the Narcissus Garden. Uh, and she did these happenings where she would paint uh, naked people with polka dots, which she called self-obliteration. Um, hmm. And uh, body festival happenings. They're called self-obliteration because uh, uh, you paint the polka dot, which represents, you know, whatever you want it to represent. But then when uh, she paints the polka dots on whatever uh, is the background, the figure and the ground sort of uh, become integrated or the figure sort of disappears. Uh, and she's still doing this now. Here's a Louis Vuitton ad that she designed where she painted the red polka dots onto this model. There she is, uh, I think, in London, uh, you know, at this opening. And then you can see the store that she designed, the Louis Vuitton store uh, showcasing her work. Just like um, Murakami, yeah, she is, um, she's in business. Hmm. She also creates these incredible rooms filled with polka dots, mirror rooms, and uh, then she'll stand in them, and she sort of disappears. Uh, her re most recent project is called The Obliteration Room, from her Look Now, See Forever exhibition. Uh, the room starts off white, and then she gives countless polka dot stickers to children, and they're asked to um, fill the room. Fireflies on Water, 2002, Mirror, Plexiglass. Uh, so she's, she's really interested in infinity and polka dots. Here's another uh, view of the obliteration room. That's cool. And uh, it's, so, it's so bright and active, the space is so active that um, anyone in the room sort of becomes obliterated. Polka dot princess. And like I said, Japan loves her. In fact... Uh, they consider her a work of art. It, you know, she's a work of art in herself, and she is crazy. 
she uh, she spent a lot of time in the mental institution, and uh, since she's been it, famous, or she's what? Since she's been famous. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. She um, she's totally nuts, but she lives her <laughs> art. You know, she kind of reminds me of Bjork. Hmm. Her life is her art, mm -hmm. and uh, if she has any message, it's um, you know, be crazy. Hmm. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to end this presentation with Kono Ike Tomoko. Uh, she's working with her own imagery, okay? So she is not pulling imagery from um, sort of the Japanese cultural storehouse uh, like all the art other artists were doing. She is um, using her own dreams and her own imagery. However, she is so successful in Japan that um, I think whatever she's tapping into does resonate with the Japanese uh, psyche. But she, um, she's most famous for these six-legged wolves, uh, flying daggers, and uh, little girl's legs with red um, shoes. She also does a lot of human-animal hybrids. Here's a couple more examples. Hmm. You can see those legs. Oh, and there's the mushrooms again, I guess. Tornado flying daggers. You can see the little girl and her leg inside the tornado. You can see the um, wolf's head kind of peeking out from the tornado. Um, sometimes she just fills the galleries with these uh, disembodied legs. But uh, this one's part of a series called Inter Traveler, which makes me kind of think that these legs aren't disembodied. It's just that the body of the figure is somewhere else in some other dimension. She'll also uh, put the legs on top of buildings. And here is an installation I got to see. The planet is covered in uh, silvery sleep, 2006. The six-legged spirit wolf made of mirrors uh, departs his skin. And um, alongside this installation was this drawing uh, the globe cross section, silvery sleep. She says she's very interested in connecting with the core of the planet, which she's bound to by gravity. And uh, she makes all sorts of cute uh, objects mm -hmm. that the Japanese people just eat up. Here's another painting by her. It's almost like some sort of inner wolf um, is trying to break out fire. So here's our review. Takashi Murakami, Japanese super flat, graphic sensibility, mushrooms, mushroom clouds, Mr. Dob, and uh, merchandise. Temyoya Hisashi uh, depicts the Japanese spirit, tattoos, uh, deities, samurai dragons, um, and that Japanese alter ego. Aida Makoto uh, explores the Japanese eroticism, the Eroguro, uh, the young girls as food. Yayoi Kusama, Japanese polka dots, infinity, and self-obliteration. And Konoike Tomoko, um, imaginary wolves, fine daggers, and disembodied legs. And uh, that is all I have. I hope... Um, this was a good introduction to what some of the contemporary Japanese artists are doing. Uh, there's a, a kind of neo-romanticism where they're trying to uh, revive or um, culturally retrieve uh, their heritage, if they're, you know, whatever heritage that is. Um, they're also laying bare some of the deepest and darkest uh, Japanese secrets. Um, and I think that by uh, looking at Japanese art, uh, it helps us better understand who we are through contrast. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. That was really, really, really interesting. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Good, great selections there. I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I've, I've never seen any of those works before or heard of any of those artists. So, well, um, they all have great. They all have great Wikipedia. Uh, pages. Um, okay. If you look up super flat, 
uh, that exhibition has a lot about um, contains a lot of information about Japanese contemporary art. It was really interesting to learn that uh, Monet was so inspired by with Black Prince and to see him standing there in his house with all those Japanese uh, paint or works in the background. That's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has any questions for David. We have a few minutes left here, so go ahead and type them in chat. It doesn't look like anybody really does, but uh, I was was going to was contemplating maybe going over a little bit of language today. Um, I was thinking about maybe covering the concept of kanji and usage and uh, proper names, just because we're going over some proper names with uh, the artist names. But I think we're pretty much out of time here, so maybe we'll uh, we'll save that for next time. Um, so. Uh, let me check the chat real quick and make sure there aren't. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions. So uh, we will see you guys on Sunday. And thank you for tuning in. And uh, thank you, David, for spending your time with us tonight. That was really, uh, really great, great information. Thank really enjoyed it. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I enjoyed uh, it. I'm glad you did. It wasn't so bad, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right, well, uh, great. Yeah, uh, eto, well, David, I'll chat with you for a minute after we go off air, but uh, minasan, eto, kyo mo, uh, it's mo to ori de, arigato zaimashita, eto, oyasu minasai, janne, matane, everybody, thanks again as always, and uh, have a good night. We'll see you next time.